there's a group of RuneScape players that are disaffected, obsessive, and neurotic. Taskmen. They play the game bereft of free will, following the orders of a digital dominatrix all to satisfy some perverse craving far beyond mortal ken. Far beyond my ken, at least. But I love myself a mystery. They sound like my kind of people. Everyone, say hello to Taskground, my task-only background noise Iron Man. He's kind of a blank slate right now, but we'll figure out a look for him very soon. Alright, Taskground. Ferris Noise has some long-haul grinds to work on, so he'll be keeping to himself for a little bit. Make sure you peruse the rulebook and record footage of all the interesting stuff that happens. But most importantly, have fun. My god, these rules are... comprehensive. Categories, subcategories, footnotes, references. Oh boy. Wow, and some of these tasks are a bit... rough. I might need to make some exceptions here and there. So, the first task is... Complete the Birthorp tutorial. Alright. Simple enough. Because the tutorial ain't much to talk about, let me lay out the foundation of the series. Originally, I was planning on going on this long explanation of what this game mode was, what the plan was going to be, clarifying rules, all that jazz. But that's all a bit too front-loaded, and it'll be more interesting to discuss things as they come up naturally. All you need to know is, not only must we complete the task we're given when we're given it, but we must complete only the task we're given. No skipping ahead or making my own decisions. If I need 30 attack, I can't just do waterfall quest. I need to just get 30 attack the normal way. I can only do waterfall quest when the task generator tells me to. The only freedom I'm allowed is completing passive tasks. These are mostly time-gated things or incredibly long grinds that would be absurd to be rolled as a main task. For instance, upgrade your Anachronia Player Lodge to rank 3. Huge time gate. That task would mostly be waiting around. So it's passive and it's something you can just do when you're able to. But don't think we'll be avoiding all passive tasks completely. They're important for progressing through the tiers. Not only must we complete every task within a tier, but we also need to complete a certain number of passive tasks in order to upgrade to the next tier. I'm just about as new to this as most of you, so we'll be exploring this together. If you're interested in playing along, there's a link to the Taskman website in the description. With the Birth Orb tutorial done, let's mark this task as completed and roll the next one. The true first task. Assist the citizens of Morton for good. We must cure Razmir Kilgan and Ulsquire Shaunsi permanently of their affliction using Serum 208. This requires an Herblore level of 15. Reaching Morton does not require Priest in Peril. You can enter the swamps between Canifus and the Gate. Well, this is certainly different. Right out the gate, we need to complete Shades of Morton. Well, I guess technically we don't have to complete it, but the rules allow us to finish any quest a task forces us to start, and since I hate seeing yellow in the quest list, we're just gonna finish it. This means our first goal is 15 herb lore and 20 crafting. We'll start with herb lore. Normally, I'd just do some easy quests for some starter herb lore XP, but we don't have that luxury here. We are allowed to kill monsters for herbs, however, provided those monsters don't drop anything that could complete another task. Unless that item is very rare, rarer than 1 in 2000. Yeah, the, the rules go into a lot of detail. Fortunately, there are plenty of enemies around Berthorp that drop guams and taramins, and Jadix here sells a bunch of secondaries we can take advantage of. But we need better gear, which means we need gold. Collecting the boots from the last level of the Stronghold of Security is a task, but collecting the 10,000 coins from the first three levels isn't a task, so it's totally fine for me to plunder this dungeon's booty. We'll use this cash to get some starter mage gear from Zaf. We won't have this for long, but it's the best we've got for now. These gelatinous abominations drop guams and taramins somewhat frequently, around 10%, and I was able to farm up enough herbs to get 7 herb lore. I switched from making attack potions to making ranging potions once I unlock them because they give just a little bit more XP. And also the secondary is easy to get. Red berries. Jadix actually sells a few. And I use Taramins to make magic potions. Jadix sells 20 magic beads, 5 of each color, so we won't have to hunt imps just yet. Once I got 7 herb lore, I realized how much I hated killing gelatinous abominations since they have a long death animation involving removing their heart, I guess, from their chest. The young wolves just north of the Taverly Bank allegedly drop herbs very frequently. Testing it out, it's true. Like a 1 in 3 chance to drop a guam or a taramin. You just have to deal with the guilt of killing young wolves. While I kill these innocent puppies, let me bring up something I think might be an issue in in the future. Loot rules. So there are some restrictions on what loot I can and can't gather, but it's not super clear. I'm allowed to process drops, I'm free to bury bones, disassemble stuff, alk salvage, but I'm not allowed to go out of my way, that's their words, to collect stuff unrelated to my task. I assume this means if I get a task that requires me to train my combat stats and I decide to kill cows, I can't collect their hides. But if I have to train crafting as well, I guess I could? And what if the drops are stackable? If I get a task to get a dark bow, 
am I not allowed to collect the noted herbs because my task isn't an herblore task? It's not going out of my way, so I, I should be able to collect them, right? This is where some exceptions might come in. It might not be the correct way to play, but leaving a lot of loot lying on the ground just feels wrong. So unless someone can convince me otherwise, I'm going to collect the loot if it's not inconvenient to do so. I won't, for instance, stockpile cow hides to save for later, but I'm also not going to leave noted dragon hide on the ground when I'm killing, say, celestial dragons. With that cleared out, we can go back to herblore. I used the wolf herbs to get to nine herblore, and every time I unlocked a new potion, I focused on that new one. Once I could make strength potion, I bought Jaddix's lymphoid roots, a euphemism if I ever heard one, and made some. But where could I get more? Well, my first thought was hill giants, but they're a pain in the ass to kill at this level. I thought there were some static spawns in this room, but it turns out it's in the resource dungeon and I can't go in there. What about hobgoblins? They do drop lymphoids quite often, but they also drop goblin mail. I'm not allowed to kill stuff if doing so might accidentally complete another task, so what do? I thought buying a batwing wand and book might help, then realized I couldn't equip those until 30 magic, so that's a no-go. Then I saw an imp. They drop magic beads. Quite frequently too. Magic potions don't give as much experience as strength potions, but if I could get beads more reliably than limpward roots, then it more than makes up for it. I just needed to find a good place to kill them. Thinking Karamja. Off to Port Sarim. On the way, I chatted with Gudrick here. There's a task that requires us to claim all rewards from him, but that comes after the quest Shadow over Ashdale. Before that, we have no restrictions on claiming the other items he offers. He gives us the Pathfinder outfit, which I didn't even know existed. Apparently, it's been in the game since 2014. It's the best armor until level 20 defense, and it also comes with a ring and amulet. After seeing that there are hardly any imps around the Karamja volcano, I reevaluated and moved south of Ardoin near the monastery. Why there are so many damn imps near a Saradominus place of worship is anyone's guess, but I ain't complaining. It wasn't much longer before I got 15 herb lore. With that seemingly endless grind done, it was time to move on to crafting. My first thought was to kill cows and collect their hides, and I got to 8 crafting this way. I was also banking the bodies I crafted for later. But then I remembered one of the rules said something along the lines of, if there's a skilling way to do something, do it that way. Really, the goal is to minimize unnecessary experience gain, which means training crafting without training other skills. The rules do allow us to mine gem rocks if we need to train crafting, but our mining level is too low for that to be anything but frustrating, especially since we only have access to common gem rocks. But farming is considered a passive skill. We can train farming whenever we want, however we want. It's a time-gated skill, so the restrictions on it are relaxed. Why do I bring this up? Well, you see, there's a little flax field south of the cow pen, and you could spin flax into bowstring at level one. It's 2007 again, baby. We picking flax. And I'm keeping the bowstring. If that's against the rules, I don't know. Take me off the taskman leaderboards or whatever. I'm, I'm not dropping 200 bowstring for no reason. Anyway, now we can finally begin our first task. Off to Mauritania. Rather than completing Priest in Peril, we can just kill this ghoul and have free access to Mauritania. I pronounce Mauritania, Mauritania, uh, Swampland. I stopped by the Canifus Bar and bought some Moonlight Mead. It heals pretty well and it's really cheap. I also made sure to grab the Lodestone. Unlocking all the Lodestones is a passive task, so we're free to get them as we see them. Now since we can't talk to Drezzle yet, we can't use the main gate into the Mortmire Swamp, so we have to circle around Canifus instead. Such is the drawback of abandoning the Priest in Peril and instead just killing the basement ghoul. Did you know that ghouls were originally a monster from Arabic folklore? In the Thousand and One Nights, there exist tricky spirit demon creatures that would lure people away and eat them. When the stories made it to Europe, the ghoul became a creature that ate corpses, which is why you find them in graveyards. It wasn't until much later that flesh-eating monsters became known as zombies, like not until the 1960s after Romero's Night of the Living Dead. They're coming to get you, Barbara. When creating the movie, Romero and the cast actually referred to the flesh-eating monsters as ghouls, not zombies. Prior to that, most zombie movies incorporated ignorant, I guess that's probably the kindest way of putting it, depictions of Caribbean and African voodoo. I would take a lot of what I say with a grain of salt, though. I'm not really an expert on anything, so some of this might not be totally accurate. Although admittedly, the history of a lot of folklore is kind of mysterious. To begin with, even experts have some issue knowing where things came from and what influenced what. I mean, there are things similar to ghouls in Eastern folklore as well. So then you have to wonder, did those influence ghouls? Are they related? Were they sourced from the same thing? Do they both exist in a similar way just because we are all humans and we share taboos? And Let's get to Morton. I'm sorry. Anyway, Shades of Morton is a pretty easy quest if it's not the first one you're doing. Fortunately, the shades aren't aggressive, but we do still have to kill five of them. Accuracy is a nightmare. I totally didn't die once. An optional part of this quest is curing both Razamire and Usquire with Serum 208. You don't actually have to do this. It's foolish not to though, since it's so easy. While you're making sacred oil for the quest, 
use the Serum 207 on the fire to make Serum 208. Use the Serum on the NPCs and that's the task. But before we officially lock it in, we're gonna finish the last bit of the quest, burning a shade on the funeral pyre. It's strange that six firemaking isn't a requirement for the quest. You needed to apply oil to a normal log and light the pyre itself. Must be an oversight. Thankfully, we can just get six firemaking in Morton with the dead trees all over the place. And quest complete. Let's mark this task as completed. I'm also going to mark down how long this task took me to do. It's not a perfect system since it just goes by playtime on rune metrics. And now that I think about it, isn't playtime used to hack people's accounts? Or is that just date of creation? If the former, uh-oh. If the latter, that shall forever remain a mystery. Our next task is unlock the ogre bowman hat. Oh, what the hell? A total of 30 chompy birds have to be killed. Requires completion of the quest, big chompy bird hunting. All right, another quest you wouldn't do immediately. We need 30 cooking, 30 ranged, and five fletching. Yikes. All right, well, ranged should be simple. I'll just kill cows for an hour or so with the charge bow Gudrick gave me. And that's 30. No super cows, unfortunately. Fletching, arrow shafts, that's it. Takes a long time. Like, this the early fletching takes forever. Now it's cooking time. The rules allow us to fish when we need to train cooking or when we need food for PVM. To Catterby. I'm surprised how quick that was. Well, it wasn't quick quick. It wasn't wiki wiki. That, that's what wiki means. It means, it means quick. But it wasn't nearly as slow as I expected. Shrimp and anchovy aren't all that bad. You catch them fast and you don't burn all that many. Wait, I have one strength. How the hell am I supposed to open this chest? It drops my strength to zero when I fail. Can I succeed with zero strength? Can I even succeed with one strength? Oh, wait, my strength potions. I knew they'd come in handy. All right, it's open. Once we finish the quest, we can start hunting our own chompies. A super fun and engaging grind. I was legitimately dozing off while doing this. No exaggeration. But there was an exciting development. A chompy dropped a cornucopia, a very rare drop on the Asgarnia and Mistelin Slayer collection log. Unavoidable, so we'll just mark that task as complete. Register a total of one unique in the Asgarnia and Mistelin Slayer collection log. There's the hat, tremble before my cute feather. Next task, discover all the words in each chapter of the needle skips. Once you've found all the words, leave the quest instance and talk to Megan to obtain a large lamp. This is most certainly a neat quest, but we're not here to talk about quests. We're here to complete tasks and kick ass, I guess, and I'm all out of ass. I, hmm. We just need to enter in all these words. It's pretty tedious, but we get a large XP lamp on the other side, which I'm going to use on herb lore. The rules say I can use quest XP lamps anytime I want, and if I'm able to save them for later, I can if I want. Time to roll a new task. Raid the demon throne room. Claim the gems from the demon throne found below Uzer. This requires partial completion of the golem quest, which means we're going to fully complete the golem quest. We have 20 crafting already, so that's convenient, but we need 25 thieving. My traditional method of thieving is to do a bunch of quests rather than actually training these slower levels, but we don't have that luxury. My first thought was to steal from men in Lumbridge, but getting decked in the face for failing isn't particularly efficient. Rather, at level two, I went north to Lumbridge Market and stole from vegetable stalls. They give more XP and don't have arms to hit you with. Also, they're not alive. As soon as I hit level five, I switch to the bakery stall. If you position yourself right, the guard won't ever see you. At least I think he won't. He never saw me. I dropped all the bread and chocolate slices, but banked all the cake. That'll be useful food in the future. I don't know if this is technically against the rules, but it seems reasonable to me, so I'm doing it. Five to 25 thieving took about 320 cakes. Maybe an hour. I didn't time it, so I'm just guessing. Let's get on with the quest. The golem is programmed to defend the city of Uzer against the demon Thamaron, but he's unable to enter the demon's throne room because because the statuettes that open the passageway are all mixed up and one of them is even missing. It's in a foreign museum because where else would appropriated relics end up? We steal the statuette from the museum, return it to the city of Uzer, twiddle the orientation of the statuettes, and enter the portal, which is a really dumb move considering, as far as we know, there's a demon general on the other side. Thankfully, the demon's a dead pile of bones. I guess when demons die die, they leave behind bones instead of ashes. While we're in here, we can plunder the throne and get some gems, finishing the task. But we're only a couple steps away from completing the quest, so we crack open the golem's head, remove his old programming, and substitute a message telling him his task is done. He now has free will. He can suffer like the rest of us. There's a really interesting video on YouTube about the history of golems. Not runescape golems, but the creatures from Jewish folklore. A lot of golems in fantasy are just Stone Age automatons, but their real origins are a bit more complicated than that. I'll leave a card for it. Check it out. But, but finish watching this video first.
Next task, obtain a uniquely colored tribal mask, wear it, and kill another Brudu victim with a mask of that color. Gotta do some Taibo one eye cleanup. But to start this minigame, we must first talk to Markeli, who just isn't in the village until after you complete Jungle Potion. Trufida sends us around Karamja collecting herbs, and if I weren't a task man, I'd gather a few extras for later quests, but I can't. Such is the fate of a Snowflake Iron Man. With the quest done, not only do we get Herblor XP that would have been really useful a lot earlier, we're now able to begin the possible long Taib Wawanai cleanup grind. Most Iron Men come here to get Goat Tuber, but not me. That comes later. The mechanics of monster spawns are simple. When cutting down the jungle, there's a chance a monster will spawn. The denser the jungle, the more likely you are to be attacked, but they also take longer to cut. Since my woodcutting level is really low, I don't actually have a choice. I can only cut the light jungle. Because I'm a weak little baby Iron Man, I can't really afford to fight anything I'm attacked by. If you run away from the spiders, snakes, and mosquitoes when they spawn, they almost instantly lose interest. I just ran from left to right each time an enemy spawned. Once the enemies lose their aggression against you, they don't seem to get it back, so you can chop jungle next to a snake that was trying to kill you a minute ago. So arrows ain't gonna work against these guys. They're weak to magic, fire spells specifically, and their defense is just too high for range to make a dent. So I banked, got magic gear, and luckily the Brudu victim was still wandering around when I returned. It took some time, but I finally managed to whittle this guy down. I did more chopping until a second one spawned and lucked out because it was another green one. I popped on the Brudu mask, almost died to poison, then returned and managed to safe spot him. I think their max range is just shy of my max range, so he wasn't able to use his magic against me. Another task sorted. For the sake of suspense, I'm not going to roll my task just yet. I'll save that for next time. Subscribe so you don't miss it, and like, comment, you know, you know the spiel. Thanks for watching.